So yeah, I was just going to say that summer is only like six weeks away. Did you know that? Are you excited for that? Kind of. I was going to say it feels like summer today, but not really. It was a little cold this morning, but this is the time of year when people are planning their vacations. They're figuring out where they're going to go for the summer. They're figuring out if they're going to go on that trip in the month of August or not. And uh, it's that time of year you got to figure that out. And I don't know how your family vacation planning goes, but when I was a kid, I was not very involved in the, in the planning for family vacation. I was told where we were going and what we were doing, and that's okay. I don't know if you're involved in the planning, but now that I'm on the planning side, there's a lot of work that goes into that. And like, for instance, this summer, my wife and I and my kids and some friends are going to Arizona for a couple of days after revival, which is kind of weird. Like, we'll go in the heat, and then we'll come back, and then, whoa, got some heat right now. Check that out. You hear that? Anyway, we're going to go to Arizona. C- congratulations. You know where I am. You can find me um, if you need to assassinate me or something. You know where I am. I'm in Arizona. But not, I mean, that's, I'm sorry, wow, that was weird. <laughs> Point is, uh, planning family vacations are an interesting thing. And when I do that, if my wife was to, let's just say, talk to me about it and say, yeah, we can go to Arizona. But, you know, I don't know if you really love us enough to take us on vacation. And uh, But, I mean, we could go somewhere and you know, we could go to that house if you want, if you could afford it. I mean, I guess if, uh, I don't know if you can really afford that. If there's a certain line of questioning that I guess my wife could ask me, that would get insulting. Same thing if you were to talk to your parents and say, hey, are we going on that vacation? Are you sure we can, like, afford that? Like, are you sure we can afford that? Are you sure you want to take us on that vacation? I mean, do you care about us enough to take us on that vacation? At some point, your parents would be like, what's wrong with you? Like, are we okay? Is there some problem between us? Are you mad at me for something, right? Like there's a certain way we could ask for things that make it certainly seem like we don't trust the person we're asking, especially if it's someone who's able to do that. If my daughter asked me, yeah, can we go on vacation? But dad, I don't know if you can afford it. Are you sure you can pay for the gas to take the car to Arizona? Like, that's kind of insulting. Not that she would ever ask that, um, but maybe at some point she could. I say all that because those things probably sound ridiculous to you. You would hope that uh, you would never ask your parents that, or that my wife would never ask me that, or my daughter would never ask me that. But there's a reality that a lot of us ask God for things in prayer exactly like that. We ask God for things, and we say, God, well, if, if you love me enough, maybe you would listen. Or if you were able to, which I don't know if you really can fix this situation. I don't really know if you can, so I'm asking you, but really not trusting you. You know, in the scriptures, when God invites us to prayer, He says that we're supposed to ask in faith. That means we're supposed to trust that God can actually do the thing that we're asking. But if we really looked at our prayer lives, and if we looked at every single request we ask God, we'd find for a lot of them, we don't even believe that God can do what we ask him to do. Now, Jesus teaches a lot about prayer in this Sermon on the Mount. And this is the last section of the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about prayer. So grab a Bible. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. These are probably some familiar words to you. You've probably heard these before. If you came to Revival Winter Edition last year, we studied these together up on the mountain, and Jesus tells the people who he's talking to. Remember, who's he talking to? Outsiders or insiders, right? He's talking to insiders. He's talking to disciples, or, or at least would-be disciples. Maybe these people haven't all become disciples yet, but he's talking to people who are interested. And he tells them after in chapter 6, he says, don't pray like a hypocrite. You know how hypocrites pray? They pray long prayers, and they pray to be heard by other people, not by God, right? And that's true today, too. There's a lot of people who pray, and they're hypocrites. They, they don't really desire the things they're asking, or they're just kind of praying so that other people will notice them praying, right? Jesus says, don't pray like that. He says in chapter 6, verse 8, because your Father knows what you need before you ask him. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but every request you've ever brought to God in prayer has not been a surprise to him. And it's not been something he doesn't know about. Like, you've never informed God about anything, okay? And that might be a comfort, right? But for some of you, that might bring up the question, well, why would I pray then? Why should I ask for something if God already knows what I need? Why, why should I ask? Well, this sermon talks about prayer a lot and says you should ask. You should pray sincerely. You and God should spend time together while you pray to God. That's a good thing. For a disciple to do. It just makes sense. He even gave us a model prayer. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Pray like this. And he gives us whole prayer that's something we can model our prayers after. And then in chapter 7, he says, just remember this. 
that you might pray, but you might doubt God's willingness or his ability to answer. Just like when we ask people for a lot of things. Sometimes we ask and it's like, this is a long shot. I don't really think you're going to listen. I don't really think you can do it. But like, I'm just kind of throwing out a request. That is not the way we pray. Although many Christians do pray that way. So I want to challenge you that this morning with these words that Jesus says here in chapter 7. So hopefully you're there by now. Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Now, if we just stopped right there, and you didn't know anything of what Jesus was talking about, and if I asked you, what does that verse mean? It'd be hard to actually figure that out. Right? Because, like, ask who and what will be given. Seek what and you'll find like you know uh, it's are you saying is this instructions at Chuck E. Cheese to get more tickets like I suppose if you ask for coins it might be given and if you seek tickets maybe you'll find them and if you knock at the door of Chuck E. Cheese maybe someone will open maybe unless they're all closed down what is this talking about like you understand that without any context this is a hard verse to interpret what is Jesus trying to say well let's keep reading verse 8 he says for everyone who asks receives. Is that true? Every time someone's asked for something, they get it? No. So what Jesus is talking about something specific here, right? Everyone who asks receives. I know that's not true in my experience. I've asked for, for ice cream and I've not gotten it as a kid, right? Uh, you know, you might ask your parents for something. You might ask your teacher, hey, can I go to the bathroom? And they say, sit down. You've already gone to the bathroom twice this period. Like, you, you know, <laughs> that's kind of weird, but you've asked for things and not gotten them right? They used to say that about Subway. It was the place, it was before there was a lot of like places where you could go order food and it was self-serve. Like now Chipotle's like that, but you know, it was a place that you could ask and they'd always say yes. Subway was like that. Now Subway, it's kind of, nah, no offense if you work at Subway, but Subway's not very good, right? Can we agree on that? Like, I don't know. It's, very, it's like definition of mid, right? It's just like, eh, if I had to, if I'm traveling, right? Subway used to be the place that they would never say no, right? point here is, like, what is this asking and getting all about? Everyone who asks receives. Wow. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. What is Jesus talking about here? Let's all well, keep reading. Maybe we'll figure it out. Verse 9. Or, so he changes the subject a little bit. Or which of you, if he has a son who asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Right? Those two things kind of look like each other. Bread and a rock. If your kid, your baby asks you for bread and says, I want some food, say, here, take these rocks to eat. What father will do that? No, well, people don't really do that. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent, right? What father would do that? The point is, Jesus is saying fathers wouldn't do that. Fathers would not give bad things to their children. That's the point Jesus is making here. Fathers would not do that naturally, right? Verse 11, if you then, who are evil, right, even Christians, right? Uh, we are not always good parents. We're not always good people. But he says, even if evil dads and evil moms wouldn't do this, and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Okay, that's the first time we actually understand what we're asking and who we're seeking it from, Okay. The last line of verse 11 helps us interpret the whole thing. So yes, this is obviously about prayer. This is obviously about God. This is obviously about you, the disciple, asking God the Father for something, good things, right? He doesn't even define all what that means. But he's talking about prayer. And, you know, the danger is here, having a sermon about prayer, you think, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I pray, I pray, I pray. Do you really pray? Like, how often do you pray? Do you actually ask for things? What's your view of prayer? Right? This is very important. This is central to being a Christian. Right? This is what we do. Christians pray, right? Well, what kind of things do we pray about? We talked about that a lot in chapter 6. But what's Jesus' point here? His point here is when you pray, you need to keep praying, and you keep trusting that God will actually answer your prayer. He didn't really talk about answering prayer in chapter 6. He said this is the kind of stuff you should do. You should pray like this. You should pray for these things and these things. He never really says, and this is how you know God will answer. But this is the text that kind of serves as the conclusion to everything Jesus said about prayer to say, and don't forget about this. 
God, number one, invites you to pray. He's saying, ask, seek, knock. And he's saying, you know, your father knows how to give give things to you. He, He can give you anything he wants to give. And he gives good things to his children. And you should expect that God would do that. And you should ask him for things, expecting that he'll answer. That's basically Jesus' point here. But some of us pray and we don't expect God to work. We pray and we don't really trust that God can even change the situation. Maybe we're asking for some situation change. Maybe we're asking for some good thing. Maybe we're asking to grow spiritually. And we're like, well, I'm going to pray this, but I don't actually think it's going to happen. The book of James says if you pray for things and you don't trust God, you are a double-minded person. Like you say one thing, but you really believe another, right? Jesus has used a word for that here in the Sermon on the Mount, pretending to be one thing, doing another, trying to serve God and money, trying to be a judge who says one thing about other people, but doesn't live up to himself. You know what that word is, right? Hypocrisy, being a hypocrite. We can pray like hypocrites too. We don't want to pray like hypocrites. We want to keep praying and trust God will actually answer two main things this morning, two main points on your worksheet. If you see them, the first one got a bunch of subpoints. That's because what we want to do here, I think Jesus is directing our thoughts here. Ask, seek, knock, right? What does that mean? Well, that means to pray. So spoiler alert, that's what that means. Pray. And don't just pray once, but keep praying. But the whole basis of the argument is really in verses 9, 10, and 11 with this illustration he gives. Jesus says, here's how you can know that your requests are will be heard and answered because God is your father. God can hear, God can respond, and God gives good things to his people. So the first point, love for you to write this down, top of your page, point number one, I want you to think deeply about the God who hears your prayers. That's where this all starts. Think deeply about the God who answers your prayers, who can hear it, who can answer it. Like that's the thing. Sometimes, and we talked about this last year, at Revival Winter Edition. Sometimes we go straight from what we're doing right into saying some words in prayer, maybe bowing our heads, maybe folding our hands, doing something like that, and then right back to real life. And it's like we just jump back and forth between those things, and we don't think about what we're doing, and we don't think about who we're talking to, right? So it's very important for you as a disciple, or even if you're not a disciple and you're starting to pray, okay? That's a really good thing. Even Cornelius, who was a a Roman who wasn't a Christian yet. The, one of the reasons that uh, someone came to him was because he was praying, and the Bible says he started to pray. Right? Paul, when he became a Christian, the only assurance that God gave to Ananias to go talk to him was he's praying, and that was enough. Say, so, okay, he's on his way to salvation, right? You've got to think about who God is before you talk to him, right? Uh, anytime you respect anybody, you don't talk to the people you respect highly the same way you talk to people that don't, right? And we've talked about this before, but this has got to be central to the way that you pray. Because this, these verses don't tell you anything to pray for, okay? That was all what we covered before. This, is, this sermon's all about how to pray. Like, what should your mindset be? What should your posture in prayer be? Well, the whole idea here is we're being invited to ask something, and Jesus says, God's a father. God wants to listen. Um, a lot of times in our prayer, we have a big faith problem. Do you remember in uh, Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus used that almost kind of derogatory term to the disciples who were anxious? He says, oh, you of little faith. Right? That was about disciples who were not trusting God to take care of their daily needs. Right? So he says, oh, you of little faith, why, why aren't you believing in God? I think the same thing is true for a lot of our prayers. If God was listening to our prayers as he is, and if God were to speak to you and to evaluate how you pray, oftentimes maybe he would say, oh, you of little faith, do you actually believe that I can do what you're asking me? And all of it gets back to, what do you think about God? Like right now, my, my daughter has this thing that she does. She picks up this phone. We have a toy phone. She picks it up, and she says, hello. Right? And then she says, daddy, daddy, get your phone. Get your phone. Right? And I'll be on the other side of the room. Like, what are you talking about? She's like, get your phone. She's got her phone out, and she wants me to get my phone out. So I'll get my phone out. I say, hello. And then she'll start talking, hello. And then she'll blah, 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 blah. Right? 
Now, I've heard that she does this when I'm not there. She does it sometimes with her mom. She does it sometimes with me. I don't really know if she's playing pretend or not. Like, I, she might be playing pretend. I'm not sure. Right? Maybe she thinks we're actually talking. I think she's kind of too smart for that because if I don't answer, she just kind of, like, puts it away and is done with it. But she's, like, she wants to play pretend, right? She wants to pretend like we're talking about it. And uh, I really don't know what she thinks. But I know enough that she does it on her own sometimes to think she knows she's playing pretend. Right? She's saying things. She's playing a game, right? She's talking to us. It's great. It's fun. But it's just a game. I bring that up to challenge you to think about your prayers, to think about how you pray in a group, to think about how you pray in your room, to think about how you pray with your family. Are you playing pretend? Like, when you say stuff, do you actually think God's listening? Or are you just kind of talking to yourself? Is it just some therapeutic thing you do that's just like, oh, I'm talking, I'm talking about my thoughts, like, and I call it prayer? Because that's not prayer. Prayer is talking to God, a person who is actually listening. It's not playing pretend. I want to challenge you with that because I think it all gets back to this, right? Who do you think God is that's going to shape the way that you pray? That's going to shape the how that you pray. So four things here, four reminders that comes from this text and from other texts. But one is that he's called our Father. And that's super important to recognize if you believe that God is our Father in heaven, we, we talked about that a lot in the Sermon on the Mount. It's a big concept. He's our Father. That, that implies his care for us. That, and he's in heaven. That implies his power over the world. The first thing you can write down at some point A is you need to recognize about God that he is a loving Father who cares for you. Do you believe that about God when you pray? That he is a loving Father who cares for you. Now, if you're a Christian... You could kind of take out the word a, like he's a loving father. You could just slash that and say he's your father. He's not just some, someone else's father. Right? You can ask someone else's dad you know, to go on vacation, but they're going to say, oh, I don't know, maybe next year if, we, if my kid brings friends. But if you ask your parents, it's usually that's a different conversation. If you are a disciple, he is your father. If you're not a disciple yet, he is a loving father who's willing to bring you in too. Your father, Jesus says, feeds the birds. He clothes the grass. He can take care of you. In chapter 5, Jesus says that your father sends his son and his reign on the evil and the good. He gives good things to all people. Everyone who's rich today, everyone who has a lot of money, that's because God gave them a lot of money. Everybody who has good health today, is because God gave them good health. Whether they are an atheist walking around today or whether they're the most devout Christian, everything people have is from God, whether people ask for it or not. Right? There's a lot of things God gives us we never ask for. Right? He's our Father, and he provides for the whole world. Do you think he will listen to your prayers? If he's providing good things for people who hate him, think about this. Like, there are people who really hate God, right? They are really against God. They're all about making fun of Jesus. They're all about going against what God's word says. And God just keeps lavishing grace on them. Do you, question, if you're a disciple, you're on God's team, do you think God is not, like, attentive to your requests? You think he's not ready to listen? When he's already lavishing so much grace on other people, you think he's not ready to listen to you? Like, he absolutely is. Here's some scriptures for you to write down from the Old Testament that talk about God's fatherly care for his people. One of them is in Psalm 103. We sung that song, Bless the Lord of My Soul. It comes from Psalm 103. Later on in that chapter, verses 11 through 14 read like this. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. God's word about God's people. God is compassionate like a father, and he understands your frame. He understands your frailties. He understands your weaknesses. He understands your lack of attention span. (laughs) He understands all of it, right? And he gets it, 
and he's your father, and he cares for you. In Isaiah 49, it's in a weird passage uh, about God's care for his people. Isaiah 49, verses 14 and 15, in the context of the, these Israelites who think God's going to leave us alone. He's going to abandon us. He's Okay, if he's going to send some foreign powers to send us into exile, it's like God doesn't really care about us anymore. That text says, but Zion, that's uh, Jerusalem, God's holy hill, will say, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten about me. Right? Well, sometimes we feel that way. God responds by saying, can a woman forget her nursing child? That she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Right? Does a mom just kind of forget about her, her three-week-old baby? Does she just forget? Right? Spoiler alert, she doesn't forget at all. Like, it's always on her mind. Like, she's not really sleeping very well when she's nursing, because you know what? All she can do is think about feeding that baby, right? That baby needs all the time. That baby really does not get out of that mom's mind until they're like a couple months old. And maybe the mom has a break in her mind. Moms barely sleep at the beginning. Okay, sorry not to scare you. But Isaiah's like, all right, people are like, God's forgotten about me. And then God responds. It's not even Isaiah talking here. God responds. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child? Does she have no compassion on her baby? Even these may forget. That's what's crazy. He says, you know what? Yeah, a nursing mother could forget, I suppose. A nursing mother could get distracted. A nursing mother could be on her phone. A nursing mother could forget all about her baby. A nursing mother could let her baby die out of neglect. That's possible. I read a story recently of a, of a lady who uh, left her eight-month-old baby at home for 10 days in like this playpen. Baby starved to death right? Was, came home, baby was dead because the mother left her baby for 10 days. She was arrested. She murdered her kid, basically, because she left this baby there. Neglect. Right? God says, yes, even these may forget. I guess it's possible for a mom to forget her baby, yet I will never forget you. That's what God says about his people. Right? Again, that's a how much more argument in scripture. It's like mothers care about their babies in general, Right? They care really a lot. You, you know God cares more for you. He, he does. You have to believe that about God. And there are times when it doesn't feel like God cares. In Exodus chapter 2, the Israelites, again, God's people, they were in slavery for hundreds of years, 400 years, in fact. They were in slavery. They were being oppressed by people. They were being taken advantage of. Their rights you know, were taken away, all that kind of stuff. In Exodus chapter 2, the way that it's put is that God saw and God knew. Right? It, it like repeats that idea. It says they, first of all, it says God heard their groanings. God had compassion. And the sentence feels like it's going to end. Right? And there is a period there. And then there's another sentence. And it says, and God saw and God knew. Right? What does that mean? You could, that was already implied in the first verse about how God heard their groanings. But no, it's like it's further emphasizing God's care for you. Okay? You're hurting, you're struggling, something's wrong. Okay, God sees, God knows. He is a loving father who cares for you. Even the way David puts it in Psalm 56, verse 8, he says about his, his own struggles. He says, I know that God has has bottled up my tears. It's like every tear that I cry, it's like God collects those tears in his bottle. He knows there's not a tear, there's not a pain that has gone without God noticing, and not just noticing from a distance, but like caring up close. That's the way God's love and his care is described for his children. Now, when you pray, not that you have to have all those thoughts in your mind at the same time, right? But you need to have the assurance that that's the God who says he cares for you and he invites you to pray. So that's one thing. You know that God is a loving father. Secondly, um, this father of yours, how is he described in the scriptures? Is he described as the, you know, deadbeat dad who uh, can't afford to, I don't know, put food on his kid's table? Is he the God that's described as the one who doesn't care and who doesn't listen? Is he the one who's described as the rich yet aloof dad 
who has what he needs, I take care of them, but he doesn't spend time? Is that how he's described? He's not really described that way. He's described as the God who is able and strong and present to help his people when they're in need. Letter B, you can write it down this way. He's able to help however he wants. You have to believe that about God. When you pray, he is able to help however he wants. You need something, you need food, you, need, you think you need a car, you think you need money for college, you think you need something. Does God have it? Yep. Okay. Some verses for you about God. Psalm 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all those who dwell therein, which means every person, everything that's in the world is owned by God. God owns it all. There's not a Ferrari. There's not a Lamborghini. There's not a Rolls Royce that God does not own. I don't know if that's ever, you've ever thought about that before. Not that he's going to give you those. <laughs> that'd be, he knows that'd be bad for you probably. You'd probably just crash it. But he owns them all. Right? Psalm 50, verse 10, God says about himself, for every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills is mine. I know all the birds of the hills and I know everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, God says, I would never tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. That's the God you're asking. He owns everything. And guess what? God doesn't need animals to make him happy, but sometimes you do, right? I wasn't thinking about it in a companionship sense there. I was thinking about it in an out burger sense, right? Uh, no offense. But I guess if you need a pet, you can have a pet too. Just don't make sure it's not a cat. You know, those are not great companions. Unless they're great companions for you, then whatever, right? But God owns all of it. He's able to give you what you need. Psalm 40, 145, so I quoted Psalm 24, 1. I quoted Psalm 50, verses 10 to 12. Psalm 145, Verses 15 and 16, listen to what God says here. It says, the eyes of all look to you, God, and you give them their food in their due season. You open your hand and you just satisfy the desire of every living thing. Is God able to help how he wants? Yes, he's able to help however he sees fit. In the New Testament, this idea is amplified even more. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32 Paul talks to Christians, people perhaps like you, who believe that Jesus came and lived a perfect life and died on the cross and has substituted out for you that you won't have to go to hell anymore, right? He says to those people, you believe Jesus died on the cross for you? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You think you think Jesus died on the cross for you? You think God provided a substitute, but he can't provide you lunch? You think that he can't, I don't know, get you to college if he wants you to go to college? You think he can't give you a car if you need a car? Right? By the way, if you need a car, that God sees fit that you need one, right? Not just that you want one. There's a big difference between those two things. I'm not saying that God will give you everything you want. I'm not saying God will get you into the college you want. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is God will get you into the college that he wants you to get into. He'll give you a car if he wants to give you one. He'll give you a job if he wants to give you one. But he'll, he'll do it. He's able to. You think he can't do it? He can do it. Second Peter 1, verse 3, God's word says that his divine power has granted to us, Christians, all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. That means that God has given you everything you need for spiritual growth. He has given you everything that you need. His divine power is granted to us all things pertaining to life and godliness. That's a crazy statement. One famous pastor talks about how we pray for stuff all the time that we should stop praying for because God already gave it to us. We want to we wanna pray that we would like, have the means necessary for spiritual growth. Guess what? You have the means necessary for spiritual growth. God gave you his word. God gave you a church. God gave you leaders. God gave you parents. Whoa, all this stuff. All the means necessary for life and godliness. Stop asking for that. Start asking that you do it, right? That's, that's the prayer request should shift a little bit. He's able to help however he wants. Good summary of this comes from Jeremiah 32, verse 17. 
Where there it says, Ah, Lord God, it's you that made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. That's Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Jeremiah 32, 17. Great summary statement. God made the heavens and the earth. Is anything too hard for God? Okay, let's just work through these. Okay, he loves us. He's able to do stuff. That's really helpful, right? Well, there's more. There's more to think about, okay? So not only does he care, and not only is he able to, like I could care for you and perhaps be able to help you, but I may lack the wisdom how to best help you, right? Like this has happened before. Maybe your parents, they care for you. They really do. And maybe they're able to help you. And then they try to help you. It's like, that was not very helpful. Has that ever happened to you before? Are you a teenager? Has this ever happened to you? Your parents try to do something. It's like, that was not really that helpful. Like you thought it was, but it wasn't helpful, right? Has that ever happened? Yes, that happens. Okay. God not only is loving and cares for you. God not only is powerful and able to help you. He also knows exactly what's best for you. That's letter C. He knows exactly what is best for you. So he's all loving, he is all powerful, and he is also all wise. He knows exactly what is best for you, and that should humble you right there. Because if there are things in your life that you just think you deserve and you don't have, or things that you think would be better for you to have, and God does not give them to you, you should be humble, and you should say, I guess God doesn't want this for me. I guess God thinks it's best for me not to have this thing. You want a car really, really badly? Perhaps you pray for that. Perhaps you work for that. And then uh, all your money gets stolen. (laughs) I don't know. That's weird, but you lose all your money. And then you you work and and you're, you're caring and you're doing all the right things for God and God doesn't give you one. Then I guess, here's the lesson. I guess God didn't want you to have one. I guess he saw it best for you. I don't know all the reasons why, but that, like, as a Christian, you have to believe that kind of stuff, right? You want a girlfriend, right? Okay. God doesn't give you one? Well, that might be your fault, but <laughs> maybe. But, but also, you know, Perhaps that's not what God wants for you right now. In fact, if it doesn't happen and you want, well, I guess it's not what God wants for you right now. You want to go to a certain college, right? And you pray to get into that college. And you work. And you do your ACTs and you do your SATs and you you slave away like a monkey at a desk, right? And you do all this stuff and then you just don't get into your dream school, right? Has that ever happened to you, right? It's happened to a lot of people. Guess what? God did not want you to go to that school then. Because God knows what's best for you. And if he doesn't give you something that you prayed for and you worked for and you think you deserve, if God doesn't give it to you, you should have the humility, and that's the key word, you should have the humility to think everything I have comes from God. If God chooses not to give me something, then that's going to be okay because God knows what's best for me. Romans 6, 8 says that, or uh, Matthew 6, 8, we already read this. Don't be like the hypocrites. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. Romans 8, 28, I was getting there, jumping the gun a little bit. Romans 8, 28, do you know that verse? Talks about Christians, those who are called according to his purpose. It says, God is working out all things for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So, do you, do you trust that when you pray? You should trust that. You should trust God when you pray. Now, he's so loving, he's so able, he knows what's best. Well, then, if all that's true, how come he doesn't answer all my prayer requests, right? That's an important question. Why does he not answer? Some, I, you, know, you might ask, you might be a, a person who, uh, who's asking for something to stop, right? You're asking for a, uh, perhaps some kind of physical problem to be not as painful, right? That could be the case. You could be asking for a person in your life to change, right? You could be asking for a lot of real heavy stuff. And then God doesn't answer it always, right? And here's a question. 
was Jesus wrong? Is, is this all not true? Right? Well, I think it comes down to this, letter D. He will deny some of your requests for your good. God will sometimes say no to your requests, some of them, for your good. Romans 8, right, right before that, right before he says, God's working everything out for good, right? not for whatever good they think, but God's good plan for those who love him. Right before that, Paul says in verse 26, two verses earlier, he says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Like, if you prayed for exactly what God wanted for you every time, guess what? All your prayer requests would be answered, right? Because if you prayed for exactly what God wanted at the exact time, boom, you'd be 100%. You'd be batting 1,000 on your prayer requests, right? But Paul says, but here's the problem. We don't always know what we should pray for as we ought to. And in that text, he says, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Right? That evokes the, the powerful mourning response that we have when uh, we're mourning over something. Like the, the groans too deep for words. Like we, there are feelings that we have and there are emotions that we have that we cannot exactly put into words. And he says the Spirit like, intercedes for us. He steps between us. We don't know what to pray for all the time as we ought. But God helps us with that. I bring that up just to say, look, sometimes God does not answer our prayer requests because we're not asking for the right things. Perhaps sometimes we're asking for the wrong things. I even said, uh, it might not even be a bad thing. Like Paul, I, I, the example I just gave you, what if you have a physical problem and God does not take away that physical problem? There's a, there's a passage about that. Second Corinthians chapter 12, Paul said that he prayed multiple times that this physical problem he had, maybe with his eye, maybe with something else in his body, would be taken away. It's like, God, you can heal me. I know, you're, I know you're loving, I know you're able, and I know you know exactly what's best for me, so please take it away. It says he prayed three times, and God said no. And what he said was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So whatever healing God could have done on Paul, he could have. He could have recovered, but he didn't. And for him, the lesson was, well, I guess God is showing his power in my physical bodily weakness. Now imagine Paul coming into town. He's this preacher. He's this writer. And he looks all messed up. I mean, perhaps he had a weird eye. In modern days, you have to wear an eye patch. It's like, that's not exactly good for like God's spokesman. But he says, well, God said, my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. There's another example. I want you to turn to this one. This is an Old Testament example. Turn to the left in your Bibles. Turn to the book of 1 Kings. Interesting. As you read the DBR, come across stuff like this occasionally. This is a, a while from now. We'll read this in a couple months, maybe a month or two. But the, the story in 1 Kings, you've got this prophet named Elijah. And Elijah is famous in the Bible for a couple things. But even in the New Testament, he's remarked as a man who prays and God answers. A couple chapters before, he prayed and said, God, don't let it rain. Stop the rain. Why stop the rain? Because in the book of Deuteronomy, remember it says like, if the people of Israel don't follow the covenant of God, then God will make the sky like bronze above them, like a, like a hard shell, like no rain. And Elijah said, God, these people aren't obeying. God, do it. Make the sky like bronze. And God does. Three and a half years, it doesn't rain. Then, while nothing is coming from the sky, which is ironic, they go up on this mountain, and it's Elijah versus all these prophets of Baal. You know what Baal was? He was the god of the rain and the thunder and the lightning, who was very distant to those people, right? Like, where's Baal? Baal's not showing up. And Elijah mocks the prophets of Baal. He does all these things in chapter 18. And then he puts, makes this altar, puts all this water on it, makes it even like which water was scarce at that time because guess what? We are in what's called a big drought. Throws all this water on the altar. And then in one little prayer, he says, God, show everybody that you're the Lord. 
and send fire down. And then guess what? The skies that were like bronze at Elijah's request, now all of a sudden, some kind of lightning or some kind of fire comes down from heaven, consumes the whole area. So Elijah is two for two on his prayer requests, right? Those are pretty big prayer requests. They sound a little bit bigger than God, please let me get into the college I want to get into. Or please God, you know, let that girl like me. You know, like those are pretty, this is a pretty big time request, right? Chapter 19, look at it. It says, Ahab, that was the king of Israel, told Jezebel, queen of Israel, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. Like he, he did that little thing too. God said, yeah, get rid of all these prophets of Baal, these false prophets, people misleading Israel, which by the way is in keeping with Deuteronomy 18. That's what they were supposed to do to the false prophets, but the king wasn't doing it, so God had Elijah do it. There you go. There's your Elijah apologetic. Verse 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Okay, that's what's called a death threat. And you know, you can get a death threat from a, you know, a kid with a weird haircut and you're like, okay, great. But, sorry, I'm just thinking who gives death threats, right? But you get a death threat from the queen of Israel who's in power. It'd be like, you know, if a foreign dictator, you were in their country and said, oh, by the way, you will be dead by tomorrow. That's not just like a little bit of a death threat, like, you know, an angsty teenager writing a note on a piece of paper. That's like the queen or the king saying, I decree that you will be dead. And if, if you're not dead, I'll be dead. Like, I'll put my life at stake on it. Whoa, okay, serious threat. Verse three, then he was afraid, as you would be too. And he arose and ran for his life, just like what you would do, right? And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. So he's even like going faster. He's leaving, maybe trying to, you know, shake the, the, the trail away so that he'll be safe. But he's all by himself. Perhaps that was out of mercy for the servant, whatever. Okay. Look at verse 4. Now we get to Elijah's next prayer request. Look at, listen, listen what it is. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he sat down under a broom tree. And he asked, that's ask, seek, knock, right? Remember how Jesus told you to ask, seek, knock, right? So we get everything we ask and seek and knock for, right? Listen to what he says. Um, it is enough. Well, he asked that he might die, right? Okay, that's the request. I want to die. Saying, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Interesting. This is request number three. Elijah says, no more rain, God. And God said, yeah. Elijah said, fire from heaven. And God said, yeah. And then Elijah, really like the easiest of the three requests, he says, God, kill me. Is he going to be three for three? Do you know the story of Elijah? Very ironic that the man who asked to die never dies. Do you know how the story goes? It's a little bit ironic. You should be a Bible reader like, oh, he asked to die. And God said, ha, ha, ha. No, not answering that one, right? <laughs> not going to do it. Look what happens in verse 5. Then he lay down and slept under a broom tree, right? He shows up at some cool tree, you know, and he, he goes to sleep. And behold, an angel touched him and said, arise and eat. He said, oh, you want to die? How about a bagel? Like that might be better for you. So, and he looked. Oh, and what happens next? Behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones. Where'd that come from, Right? Uh, well, didn't come from anybody. He's in the wilderness. That's a miracle that a bird, oh, sure, look at what happens next. Yeah, hot stones in a jar of water. And he ate and he drank and he lay down again. So he, slept. So he got a nap. God said, no, I'm going to give you a nap and I'm going to give you a bagel, right? And drink your Gatorade or whatever. And the angel came again a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and he ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. In other words, Mount Sinai, down in the Sinai Peninsula. It's hilarious how much, like, that gets played out even in the book of Matthew. That, like, God feeds the birds and he can feed you. 
that he gives bread in the wilderness? Did God ever give bread to his people in the wilderness ever? Like, oh, yeah, he did it for like 40 years. Oh, what, 40, 40 days, 40 nights? Oh, but the people, they weren't at Mount Sinai. Oh, wait, they were going to Mount Sinai. Whoa, it's, it's God redoing it all again. And that's the whole point. It's Elijah going back to the place where the Israelites came from, and God sustained Elijah just like God sustained the Israelites for 40 years. All of it's like, whoa. And then like Jesus comes along and he goes to like the wilderness and is not fed with bread and he's sustained for 40 days and for, whoa. And then like he goes to the wilderness and he feeds people bread that came out of nowhere as a miracle. Whoa, it's like the whole Bible fits together. There you go, right? But what's the point here for you? Elijah prays a very simple request. God, just kill me. Elijah is suicidal and God says, no, you need to take a nap and you need some food, right? It's a good lesson. If you're suicidal, maybe you should take a nap. Maybe you should eat some food, right? Perhaps, right? That won't solve everything, but that might be step one, okay? My point is, this is a godly man who's asked really big things from God before, and God says no, because that's not what God wanted for him. He didn't want him to die, so he says no. Some of your requests are bad requests, even though they feel like they're the right requests. Elijah is more holy than you or me. He's more godly than you or me. My bet is he knows the law and Deuteronomy better than you do and better than I do, right? He's a holy man. This is not a sinful, bad, you know, bad dude. This is the best guy who's around. Yet, in his emotions, he asked something of God that was wrong. This is possible for you too. And the point is, God will deny some of your requests for your good. It's a good thing he does that. He doesn't answer all of our requests. Right? Ask your leaders if they ever prayed that like they would, you know, when they were in high school, I pray that I would go to that college. And then God said no. And how like, wow, so glad God didn't answer that prayer. God, I pray that I'd marry that person. And then God said no. It's like, wow, so glad God didn't answer my prayers. The older you get, the longer you live, the more you pray, the more you look back on some prayer requests and say, wow, I'm really glad that God in his grace did not give me the thing that I wanted at the time. All that leads to the ask, seek, knock. Point number two, basically the summary here. I want you to pray like you actually expect God to act in his time. God's going to act in his time, but you need to pray like he actually is going to do something. Maybe not in your time. I'm not saying pray with the expectation that this will always happen exactly when you ask, but you better expect that God will act. Once you do that, you should turn to the, to the right in your Bibles. Look at James chapter 5, another time Elijah shows up. So once you see these two Elijah passages, now you have a little bit better appreciation for who this guy is. That sets up how we should pray. James chapter 5. Once you write down, uh, pray like you actually expect God to respond and act in his time. Turn to James chapter 5 and look at this passage with me. James 5. And you start in verse 13 if you want. It says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. It's good, good advice. If, is anyone among you cheerful? Let him sing praise, which is just prayer in a different direction. It's just prayer because we're happy. Is anyone among you sick? Well, let him call the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, right? What does that mean, right? Take your medicine and get some prayer, right? Even the pastors can be involved in that, right? Especially back in those days when uh, most people did not have a lot of access to uh, medicine. It says, yeah, bring the Tylenol and uh, let, let the pastor pray for you or whatever. He says, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, right? Wow, that's interesting. So God will hear our prayer, and that God might restore people back to health? Totally. Oh, and by the way, if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Wow, what do I do with sins? Verse 16, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There's like, whoa, maybe the sickness and the sin might have something in common. Maybe one led to the other, perhaps. That does happen. You can imagine if someone's sick based on some uh, sin that they committed and God said, no, you're going to be sick. I'm using this to humble you. And they're praying, God, please take away the sickness. Please take away the sickness. And God says, no, you need to repent of your sin first. And all of a sudden you repent of your sin, things change. That's good. It says in verse 16, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Do you pray 
like that, expecting God to work as you pray. You should. Elijah, verse 17, was a man with a nature like ours. Wow, Elijah, remember him? With a nature like ours. Like, he gets bummed out too. Remember how he got really bummed out and wanted to die and God gave him a bagel, right? It says he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Point is, look, you got to pray expecting God to work. Just because you think God's not running around doing miracles all the time does not mean that you should not pray for God to act. Elijah prayed, God acted. We should pray expecting God to act. Why? Because God's word says you should ask, you should seek, and you should knock. And God opens those doors for you. Now, is God going to answer every prayer? No, we talked about that. There are some things that God does not want to answer right now. Some good things you might even pray for that he will answer later. But he says, not now. All this should change the way that you pray. Like, you know when people complain about stuff and you don't know, like, is this a real complaint? Like, do you want to change something or are you just kind of complaining to complain? You know, we complain in different ways. One of the ways that we complain is, we, you know, we tell the manager, right? The, the Karens among us, you know. I know you don't. You're too uh, socially awkward to complain to the manager. But your parents, they send the food back, right? Or they, you know, I'm not taking all your parents, sorry. I, but, like, you know, there's like certain complaints that you feel like they're not, I'm not just, like, saying I don't like something. Like, I'm saying it, I'm expecting some kind of response. Just remember, if you're going to complain to God, which you can do, right? And that's not always wrong to complain to God. But if you complain to God about a situation, Remember who you're talking to. You're talking to the one with the authority to change it. It should bolster your faith and also might protect praying for things that you shouldn't pray for. I hope this text and this, this study this morning redirects your requests to ask in the right way. Let me pray that you would do that this week. God, we are thankful for your word and how we see examples of people like Elijah who have a nature like ours. We're thankful that although we're not perfect people, that you give us instruction in your word Pray that we would actually pray, that we wouldn't just want to pray and plan to pray, but we'd actually pray. For some people, we know that the first prayer they need to pray is that they would repent and humble themselves before you, that you'd forgive their sins. We know that's the thing that you're inviting them to do. A couple of verses later, you'll tell us to enter by the narrow gate and tell people that we need to be saved through you. So I pray right now, you would help us this week be people who constantly go to you, that we don't complain to others, that we complain to you first. We expect you to work in your time. Thank you for using this message to bolster our faith. Pray that we trust you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.